Hello, dear listener. It's your patron saint of scares, Blair Bathory. If you're hearing my voice now, you have survived another night of fright, and I'm so happy to have you here. Although Halloween has come and gone, that doesn't mean the spooky stories have to stop. We are here 365 days a year to quench your thirst for horror. Before we get started, I wanted to tell you some fun things happening on our Patreon. We have a brand new members-only Discord where you can connect with other people who love something scary and all things spooky. And we will also be sharing monthly bonus episodes from the podcast starting later this month. As a patron, not only can you be a part of the community, but you can be a part of the horror and hear your name featured in one of our weekly stories. So join us at patreon.com slash snarled. You can find the link in our episode's notes. It's November 1st, and that means it's the perfect time to start shopping for the holidays. We have the perfect gifts for you to give or get. Your favorite Something Scary fan will be thrilled with our new hoodie or t-shirt. And for the writers out there, we have a journal. There is literally something for everyone. Go to somethingscary.com and check out our new shop to get discounts all month long. We are all born into this world, live our lives, and then die. It's something every one of us will experience. Although we shouldn't fear death, fearing the dead is a different story. Souls trapped on the wrong side, waiting to be free, or ready to do damage to those who harm them on earth. So be aware of the dead among us. First, death in Sleepy Hollow followed by Bedtime Blue. Then, the house breathes. Finally, in our featured story, The Day of the Dead. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week, and of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com slash snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at something scary at snarl.com. So, want to hear something scary? The dead among us. We're always so eager to play games like the Ouija board, but often we don't stop to think about if the spirits want to play with us. Like in this story I wrote just for you. It was a long drive from Michigan as Mike gripped the steering wheel and I sat eagerly waiting for the next destination on our trip. I nodded along, half attentive, as I wrote out my itinerary for the night, wherever we wound up. Truth be told, I was hoping to stop off in Sleepy Hollow anyway. I was tired and had work to do. I had initially wanted to make it down to the city for the night, but the moon would be a bit clearer in Sleepy Hollow. Sometimes, it's good to let him feel like he had the idea anyway. The only place with rooms left was a janky little chain hotel on the edge of town. We resigned to TV in the smoke-stained room, but Mike was feeling restless. Lucky me. I just feel like we're in a place for it, you know? His voice groaned with a tone of genuine disappointment. We gotta do something spooky. He was always bored. Mike scanned the room with serious intent. Without a word, he lunged off of the bed and ran over to our bags. He dove into his duffel bag and dug out his notebook. I have a stupid idea, he half shouted with childlike joy. I couldn't help but laugh. In the few months we'd been together, I could never resist one of Mike's dumb ideas. All of my friends told me to keep away. He had a bit of a reputation, but I knew he'd be perfect. Mike tore the cardboard backing off of his notebook. He dug back into his bag and pulled out a permanent marker. He held it up in the air like a knight with Excalibur. Let's try to summon a ghost, he yelped. A wild grin cracked across his face. The Headless Horseman, he sang, doing his best spooky voice. I wondered if he knew that the horseman wasn't actually a real guy. I rolled my eyes. Mike glared at me. He fashioned a Ouija board out of the notebook backing. He pulled the glass lid off of one of the cheap bedside candles for us to use as a planchette. Mike hurried onto the bed and slapped the setup down between us. The mood not being quite right with all the hotel lights turned on. 
the mood just wasn't spooky enough. Mike flung himself off the bed. He lit a candle and clicked all the wall lights off on either side of the room. An erratic orange glow flung twitching shadows across the walls. The mood was just right for Mike's seance to begin. Okay, lay your fingers on the thing, Mike commanded as he gestured towards the candle topper. I shrugged, begrudgingly going along with the charade. We call out to thee, O horseman. Speak to us through this oracle. Mike looked around the room. Only the hum of the air conditioner responded. O great spirit, please give us a sign you're with us now. As Mike pleaded with the empty room, I felt a sudden rush, goosebumps, nervous anticipation. Spirit, I beckon thee, show us. The candle flickered out. Mike was taken aback by the immediate reaction to his questions. Spirit, name yourself. Mike spoke each letter aloud. B, A, E, L. The planchette froze on L. Mike didn't hesitate. Spirit, what did you do when you were alive? The planchette trembled. N, E, V, E, R. Mike cocked his head. A, L, I, V, E. Mike stared at me through the dark. What do you think that means? Never alive? I didn't know what to say. Are you human? Mike asked. The planchette wobbled on the board. N, O. I jerked my hands away. Mike was entranced. Why are you here? He asked. Why, O, you? Mike? I tried to pause the ritual, but Mike was beyond focus. The candle whooshed back to life. In the flicker, I saw a shape in the shadows on the wall. A human figure, hunched over, as though it was trying to hide or sneak. Even in the brief second it was visible, I could see that its fingers outstretched in jagged points. Mike! Baby, he replied. It's just a... Mike's voice cut off like a smashed light bulb. A look of despairing confusion oozed over him. He tried to speak, but only the wet pop of saliva crackled through. A horrible stench churned into the room, the awful stink of decay. Mike's eyes rolled back. He clawed at his throat. He tried desperately to scream. His body contorted before me into a gnarled tangle. Spit frothed through his teeth as his back arched to its limit. Spirit, I whispered, take this vessel. Mike's head turned against his will, towards the wall. The flames from the candle burned brighter. The figure took shape. Bale, the unclean spirit. I had been preparing for almost two years when I met Mike. Always up for an adventure, curious, bold and brash. A known creep who had a really hard time with the word no. The tricky thing was with Bale, he can only accept a willing host someone who invites him in. I'll admit, the irony was not lost on me. Mike writhed on the bed, his jaw clenched, his arms contorted back as his fingers jut out in rigid, angular hooks. Then, one by one, snap, 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 snap. Throughout his body, bones split and cracked, his jaw wrenched to one side and his eyes fluttered in brutal agony. His head wrenched back to its very limit. For a moment, I thought his head might come clean off. Mike's mouth wrenched open, a pathetic, helpless whimper snaked out of him from deep in his throat. It was the last sound that Mike would ever make. His body collapsed, limp on the bed. After a moment, our eyes met, and Mike smiled. From Amazon Music, I Hear Fear is a new anthology series of suspenseful stories hosted by Carrie Mulligan. These stories are inspired by true events and real places. So the next sound you hear could be your very own scream. In each episode of I Hear Fear, you'll be treated to a new psychological thriller. 
a forest monster who lures teens into the woods and never lets them return. A line of beauty products that takes the search for youth to dark extremes, and an EDM party that turns deadly when the DJ takes over more than just the dance floor. These might sound like urban legends, but I Hear Fear proves the scariest stories of all of the ones are true. I Hear Fear will introduce immersive horror and lead you straight into the heart of darkness. Prepare to be taken on a journey into the unknown. Hey, Prime members, listen to Amazon Music exclusive podcast. I Hear Fear in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. We are most vulnerable when we are asleep, and even the thought of not being alone can be terrifying, as in this story written by Janine Pipe. It all came to a head the week I woke up with new bruises three days in a row. It had been happening on and off for around a month, and I just couldn't take it anymore. Who the hell beats themselves up in the middle of the night when they're in bed, wrapped in blankets and pillows? The latest marks around my neck were hard to cover and even harder to explain since I had literally no explanation. So I decided to record myself sleeping and see if that would shed any light on the situation. If it turned out I was some sort of sleep wrestler and was injuring myself, then at least I would know. And if it showed nothing, well, I guess I'd make an appointment with my physician. I set up my laptop on the bookcase at the end of the bed where it would capture the best bird's eye angle and drift it off. I left a bedside lamp on which emitted just enough light for the camera to record with. It wouldn't be amazing quality, but this was for my own peace of mind, nothing else. The next morning when I woke, my shoulders felt sore before I even sat up. And sure enough, when I checked in the mirror, there were two new angry looking bruises. I made a pot of coffee and sat down to watch the footage. I slept from 11 p.m. until 7 a.m. So I sped up the video and started to scrub through. It was at 4.17 that something happened. At first, I missed the start of it. Watching it on fast forward meant I caught a shadow on the screen and saw myself moving, the covers being pulled down, then something else. I stopped the recording quickly and moved the cursor back to rewatch it again slower. There must have been a glitch, or a trick of the light. I took a deep breath. My skin started to prickle as the impossible events unfolded right before my eyes. 4.17, the bedside lamp began to flicker. I read every night and has never once done that. 4.18, a dark shadow appears next to the bed. There is nothing on that side of the room that could cause that shadow, and it is immediate not gradual. 419, the shadow has moved closer and now falls partially over my sleeping form. It still looks very much like a long, dark blob. 420, the covers are being pulled down slowly, away from my face. I sleep snuggled up, so until then, only my head was visible. Now, the tops of my shoulders and chest were clear and I was instantly glad of wearing a t-shirt to bed. I then laughed at the absurdity of even caring since I was the only person who'd ever seen this footage and wasn't the explicable shadow and self-moving duvet more important than whether I was naked or not. 421, although I have zero recollection of it, it looks like I start to wake up, at least from what I can see on the camera. I seem to be trying to raise my head, prop myself up and then (gasps) I gasp. I'd caught a glimpse of the scene when watching on fast forward, but now I could see quite clearly my head lie back down onto my pillow and my entire body suddenly moving down the bed so my feet were dangling off the end. I watched myself again attempt to sit up and be forced back down. I hit pause for a moment, my hand trembling. It looked on the footage as if I was being held down by a force. I absentmindedly rubbed my shoulder where the hand-sized bruise continued to blossom. Everything I'd seen so far had been weird and unsettling, but I hadn't gotten to the frame yet where I'd seen it. I could feel my heart racing. Maybe I should just delete the recording right now. That way I'd never know if I'd really seen something, but at least I wouldn't have seen it again. My finger hovered over delete for just a moment. Then I hit play. 422. Just five minutes of whatever this was, 
and it happened. Whether it realized it was being recorded, I don't know. I don't even know what it is. But it turned away from me on the bed. It became more than a shadow. It glided towards the laptop and it looked right into the webcam. I screamed. It was even worse than I originally thought. The initial glance I'd caught when the recording was whizzing through on fast forward. I thought I'd seen a face looking into the camera. I'd been right. The face, its face, looking right into the lens while I was still on the bed clearly behind was me. It was my face. And then the recording went black. A single message appeared on the screen. File permanently deleted. Have you ever felt someone watching you while you sleep? Would you ever be brave enough to record yourself and see if something was really there? The other day, a friend of mine confided in me about how some things were going on in her life. I was very worried about her and immediately I suggested that she go to Talkspace and set up a time to speak with someone. It's been so helpful to me and I wanted her to have the same kind of care that I have gotten. Talkspace offers therapy and psychiatry, and you can talk with someone from the privacy of your own home. Talkspace is mental health care that meets you wherever you are. It simplifies taking care of your therapy and psychiatry needs because it eliminates the need to commute to appointments, miss time at work, or line up childcare in order to attend sessions. Plus, instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send text messages to your therapist to let them know the issues you're facing in real time. It's mental health care made easy. There have been times where I have put off therapy because setting up appointments were so difficult and having to go somewhere physically was not always easy. I know that with Talkspace, they make it so easy to embed it in your ever-changing schedule because life is always changing. You're always changing. Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. So instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24 seven and they'll engage with you daily five times a week. As a listener of this podcast, you get $100 off your first month with Talkspace to match with a licensed therapist today. Go to Talkspace.com and make sure to use the code SCARY to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's SCARY and Talkspace.com. Sometimes you're stuck in a prison of our own making and you'll die before you get out. Like in this story inspired by Misty. I've never believed in the paranormal or supernatural stuff. It seemed like a load of old hooey to me. Now, however, I'm beginning to wonder if I was wrong. The day before the weird stuff started, my girlfriend and I had broken up. We'd been drifting apart, but it still hurt helping her pack her things. After she was gone, the house seemed too big, silent and eerie. I began to feel on edge and worse, It seemed like someone, something, was always watching me. I searched the whole place, inside and out, but found nothing. I brushed it off as my imagination and I tried to ignore it. Two days later, things got worse. That sensation followed me all over the house. It became so unnerving, I used any excuse to stay away. My behavior drew the attention of my friends and relatives. They knew how badly I had taken the breakup. After a week, my brother sat me down and told me how strange I had been acting, not calling anyone back, hitting the bars by myself. I told him I'd make no promises, but I would try to do better. He could see I was struggling, so he pressed. What exactly was wrong? It's the house we bought, I told him. Every room I enter, I feel like someone is watching me. I can't stand being there all the time. He suggested I was just hung up on Jen leaving as the house reminded me so much of her. Or, my brother's eyes narrowed. Then he said, you're finally admitting ghosts are real. That was never going to happen. But the last thing I wanted was for my family to worry about me. I stopped going out quite as much, still finding ways to stay away from my house when I could. I took more overtime when it was available and purposefully forgot items when grocery shopping. Those breaks were cherished because when I finally got home, I'd feel the weight of that relentless gaze. Then the smell started, a mixture of light decay and bleach with an underlying scent of lavender. 
lavender, which reminded me of Jen's shampoo. At first, I thought a mouse had died in the vents. When my brother visited, the odor was even stronger, and he isn't the type to overlook something like that. Surprised he didn't comment straight away, I asked if he could smell anything different than usual. He sniffed and then said, did you plug in your air freshener or something? Did you want me to congratulate you? He couldn't smell anything. Said I was probably so stressed I was imagining it. But after he left, I thought it had gotten even worse. I swore the stench was manifesting to spite me. A few days later, I sat to eat breakfast. By then, I was able to ignore the constant stench. The invisible gaze, however, was wearing on my nerves. My hands began to tremble. I was always looking over my shoulder and my lack of sleep was visible. The TV news caught my attention. A report of a missing person began and I almost choked on my food. Jen's picture was shown. Tears gathered in my eyes. Despite breaking up, we were still on friendly terms. I didn't want anything bad to happen to her. That's also the first time I heard the noise, a strange metallic thump coupled with quiet scratches. I waited a moment, hoping to pinpoint the source. When it didn't repeat, I tried to convince myself it was just my imagination. Each day, I walked on eggshells. My eyes burned from the lack of sleep. When I couldn't stay awake anymore, sleep forced me under, and the nightmares began. I woke up screaming every night, unsure what was real or not. I couldn't move around my house without feeling terrified. I stopped answering the phone. As I sat in the living room, every light in my house turned on. I heard a knock at my door. Two police officers stood on my front porch. I was sure they were there because of Jin. You seem on edge, one officer said, taking in my zombie-esque appearance, my exhausted state. They'd been informed that Jin and I were on rough terms. No, we just drifted apart, I rebutted. She told me she was going to stay with another friend in a different state. I asked her about it, even warned her to be careful, but she didn't tell me much. I tried to focus on the officers, but the putrid stench of death grew stronger, demanding my attention. The metallic thump had positioned itself directly above us. I felt the color in my face drain. The officer asked why I seemed so distracted. It's so stupid, I replied. I think my house is haunted, but Jin loved it here. I can't leave. I couldn't hold back my tears. The officers gave me a pitying look and said they would find her, but that I shouldn't plan on leaving town. Of course not, I answered. I was there to help with anything they needed. Afterward, I headed to my bedroom, the noise following the whole way. Alone, I pulled down the attic stairs. I moved over to the vents there, taking a seat to embrace the unnatural silence. It was the only place I didn't feel watched. And then I started to giggle. <laughs> I almost broke, I said. <laughs> you almost won. I reached over, opening a door I'd made in the vent and pulled out a small wooden box. It was ornate, decorated with flowers burned into the wood. It came in the mail the day after Jin left. I'd helped her pack her bags and load the car, but I'd known she would go missing. Unfortunately for her, I have a lot of connections. She was young and healthy, perfect for organ donation. The black market is always looking for donors. All I wanted in return was her heart. I lifted up an orb of clear resin. The perfectly removed organ rested in its center. Jin always had a beautiful heart. It's the reason I wanted to win her over. She was so beautiful and kind, something I wish I was at times. I held the box close, exiting the crawl space. I'm now relocating the ill-gotten object. A heartbeat from underneath the floorboards can't be as frustrating as her constantly gazing down on me. Can it? Have you ever done something you regret? And did it end up haunting you forever? If so, tell us your story by sending us an email 
at something scary at snarled.com. In our final story, join my co host Stephanie as she tells the tale of Dio de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead which we have animated and posted over on youtube.com slash snarled. It was Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. I eagerly set up our family's altar. It's a tradition that goes back almost 3,000 years. A day to celebrate those who have died, and it's usually our ancestors. We set up the living room with photos of our deceased family members, along with candles and special treats to commemorate each of them. This year was different because my abuela had just died. I was still heartbroken and took extra care with her offerings. I placed tiny skulls made out of sugar in front of each of those who had passed. While the altar stays lit, it's customary to go outside and celebrate with our neighbors, telling stories of those who died to honor them while also celebrating the life we still have. As the music festival began to play outside, My parents were in good spirits. My brother, Antonio, on the other hand, had just entered puberty, and if being a menace was an occupation, he was a CEO. My parents asked us to finish placing treats on the altar while they went out to meet the neighbors to dance. While I was putting the skull candies in front of each member of the family, Antonio was eating the leftovers out of the bag. Not a complete defilement, but rude, no doubt. I simply rolled my eyes, and then at one point he tried to lightly kick the table to see if he could knock anything over, forcing me to work harder. I tried not to give him attention, but he was getting on my last nerve. Before we were about to leave to join our parents, I looked at my abuela Tute's photo, and I pulled out a special treat, a bottle of Pepsi, which was her favorite to splurge on, as I poured a glass for her on the altar. Boo! Antonio jumped out from behind the door with a skeleton mask on and scared me half to death. Thanks a lot, you jerk, I shouted. I had spilled soda all over the tablecloth. I went to grab a towel from the kitchen. When I returned, the skull candy in front of Abuela's photo was gone. I turned to ask Antonio if he knew anything and saw him chewing. And that was it. I ripped the bag of candies from his hand. I informed him I would tell our parents and he'd lose his phone for a week. He jumped up, swearing it wasn't him and that he didn't touch anything on the altar. We stormed into the kitchen, still arguing. I put away the candy and then we heard a bang coming from the living room. We rushed back in to see what had happened. Checking the altar, that's when I saw all the skull candies were missing. Then the temperature dropped instantly. I turned to scream at Antonio, but saw true fear in his eyes. He didn't take the skulls. When we were not alone, as if to confirm this, a breeze ran through the room. I rushed to close up the window, but it wasn't open. Another gust blew the candles out. It was now pitch black, except for a tiny ember from the candle in front of Abuela. The flame looked as if it was trying to reignite. Antonio grabbed my hand and slowly we crept towards it. The flame then grew bigger and bigger. But it wasn't fire. We looked closer. Could it be? She began crying out in Spanish, flames licking her face as she spoke, but she wasn't looking at me. Her sights were set on Antonio, who was in complete shock. She screamed at him without warning. She lunged from the flame, grabbing him by the throat and pushing him up against the wall. She threatened that if he didn't behave, he would be next on the altar. She then suddenly softened. She let go of his neck, slowly pacing his feet back on the ground. She wiped away his tears and dusted off his shirt. She said, now be the good boy, I know you can be. Then she floated my way and without saying a word, she embraced me with the biggest smile of pride and showed me her hand. It was filled with the candy skulls. She winked and then began to eat them one by one as she moved back towards her candle. 
She grew smaller and smaller until the light went out and the temperature rose again. Our parents burst through the door, laughing and dancing and asking us to hurry. We stood there frozen from the encounter. It took a moment to realize that there was light, warmth. The altar was back to its original state. Everything was as it should be. A lot has changed since the Dia de los Muertos. Antonio has been on his best behavior since. We couldn't be closer, and the photo of Abuela now has a cheeky little smile that wasn't there before. And only Antonio and I know the story behind it. This week's podcast stories were edited by Sarah Lukasiewicz, Janine Pipe, and Stephanie Strange. Narration by Blair Bathory and Stephanie Strange. Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Additional audio editing by Calvin Linderman. Art and graphics by Irma Richardson. Produced by Anna Villalobos. Executive produced by Gail Gilman. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Linderman. <laughs>